Alex here with part 51 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'll direct my viewers to part 0 if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over, it's closed, cannot be reopened, and that's because my excess parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. Not a whole lot has happened between the previous video and this video, at least with respect to the time gap as to when these two documents were filed. It's just my reply brief that we're about to go into, and it's my response to the government's answering brief. I do recall my mindset being really, really frustrated. And that is because I felt like the government was really pushing this technicality, and I didn't think it was fair. And I've already talked about this quite a few times, so I'm not going to kind of beat a dead horse here, but I will tell my viewers that you should watch Fairness versus the Law, because... The law is fair coincidentally in many areas because we as a democratic society expect that, but it's not necessarily fair. There's a difference between, you know, necessarily being fair and coincidentally being in, uh, being fair in those particular areas where the legislature decided to be, you know, as fair as they decided to be. But that is not something that's just a rule that applies across the law. It's not. We expect it as a society, but it's not true. And it's especially not true when the technicality is jurisdictional. That is a very big deal to the court system. It's not to us. Many of us think, whatever, it's a guy in a robe. Let him make the call. Who cares? But to the government, to the judiciary, whether or not a judge has jurisdiction over a particular issue or over a particular person is important because if the court doesn't if the, if that particular judge does not have the authority to render a decision then anything that he decides to do is null and void from the beginning so while we think you know as just ordinary people while we think well you know who cares it's a guy in a robe that's his job he's a judge let him make a decision well we think that's okay that's not what they think you know is okay and they take jurisdictional issues very seriously so my mindset at the time was really frustrated it wasn't necessarily positive or negative it was also not necessarily surprised because the government had pushed another technicality earlier as well and that had to do with them being served properly and that's yet another jurisdictional problem. Those those two issues are valid points that the government is, is raising. But um, like I said, me at the time being very new to any of this, we're looking at 2010. I had barely started representing myself later, uh, the later half of 2008. So not even a full two years there. <clears throat> and I'm sure that it's going to come out in this reply brief. At this point, I think... We should actually take, go, ahead, go ahead and take a look at what I have filed. Here we have my appellant's reply brief. In the first paragraph, I identify myself as the petitioner and I indicate to the court that I am appearing in proper person, which means I'm representing myself. Here we have table of contents, similar to what the government put in their answering brief in the previous video. video. <clears throat> table of authorities, some statutes from Montana, which is a little odd. And there are cases that appear to be mainly federal cases. First, we have the reply to the case statement. Looks like I'm taking the approach that I've mentioned before that I don't recommend where I pinpoint specific paragraph numbers and agree or disagree to them. You don't have to take this approach. This is what's required in the um, 
answer to a complaint or petition and also in the reply to counterclaim. In fact, they don't really use, I don't think they use agree or disagree, I think they use admit or deny. They also use this format in request for admissions, but to use it anywhere else looks a little weird. And I think they encourage this in the self-help forums, which is probably where I got this idea from. But just letting my viewers know, you don't have to take this approach. You can just write a reply, you know, just you know, spell out what you're replying to. You don't have to go paragraph by paragraph. And it looks like I am agreeing with the first three paragraphs. If you'd like to, you can take a look at the answering brief in the previous video and take a look precisely at what I'm agreeing to. But for the purposes of this video and to keep things moving along, I'm only going to look into the sections that actually have some controversy or some disagreement. So paragraph four, I'm disagreeing. I'm holding that as a fundamental and general rule, parents are entitled to know where their children reside. The issuance of a fictitious address um, to my ex is being used to conceal the residence of a child. So basically, I am controverting this notion that I want to know where she lives just because I want to know where she lives. I'm clarifying that I want to know where she lives because I want to know where my son lives. The other thing here is I am pointing out that the statute 217.462 only allows a fictitious address to be issued to an actual victim. And uh, I don't know if I talk about the protective order here. It doesn't look like it. But I do eventually talk about that. Moving on to the second paragraph here, which is the reply to argument. Reply to lack of jurisdiction authority over case. I am disagreeing. Pursuant to the statute 217.462, the legislature explicitly delegated the task of issuing a fictitious address to the respondent, which in this particular case is the Secretary of State. And the government also, well, the legislature specifically, outlined the requirements to which the government, or the Secretary of State in this case, has to abide by. Um, this is true, but what I don't understand at this point in time is how statutory construction works. I am reading this one specific statute in my favor, 217.462, and I am arguing that because this statute speaks in this precise way, the government messed up, so therefore I'm entitled to relief. But that's not really how statutory construction works. In fact, I have a video dedicated to it, and I don't figure out how it works until much later when I start winning appeals. But the Supreme Court of Nevada, when two different statutes are contradictory or in some way appear to say something different, the, they expect you to read them what they call um, harmoniously. And they also expect you to look to the intent of the legislature as well. When this happens, they have this rule called the ambiguous rule, I guess. They have the plain language rule, which is the opposite, which it says if a statute is plain on its face and it says a certain thing, that's what the court must do. But then they also have a rule for how to deal with ambiguous statutes. And sometimes it could just be that the statute itself is um, shady or, or fuzzy as to how it works. Other times it might be because two different statutes, which may be clear when read alone, um, contradict each other. And that's kind of what we have going on here. 217.462 contradicts another statute. And so the Supreme Court will take a look at a manner in which they can read those statutes harmoniously. And they will try to do so in a way that avoids an, uh, an, an absurd result. That's the phrase they use. And part of that is they will look to the intent of the legislature. And they ultimately do conclude that the other statute, the one that I am very frustrated with, takes away the Secretary of State's uh, discretion and forces the Secretary to issue the address. So the remedy that they put for um, that they put together for me is not what I expected them to do, but it does solve my problem. It does give me um, a path to solving this problem later on after that case publishes, but we're not quite there yet. I just do want to explain to my viewers that what I'm doing here is a common mistake for a person who's not an attorney to make. I found one statute, I'm reading only that one statute, and I'm saying, hey, this doesn't make any sense, therefore help me. Um, fix my problem. And it's not really the way that the courts approach reading statutes. They, as I mentioned, follow the rules of statutory construction. In some states, they call it the rules of statutory interpretation. I think it sounds a little bit more clear that way, but not in Nevada. Scrolling down, paragraph two, I disagree. The unique position of the court stems, <coughs> excuse me, in large part from the deep commitment of the American people to the rule of law and to constitutional government. I don't know why. These these sort of approaches, um, kind of, I, I think I call it speech writing. 
It's not really recommended when it comes to dealing with statutes, rules, and case law and court papers. It's better to just keep it as terse as possible and laden with authority. And by authority, I mean statutes, rules, and case law. I'm kind of speaking more abstractly here about our rule of law in this country and the constitutional government. You can do that, but it's not very effective. The um, Actually, I want to make something a little bit more clear here. It's not that it's not effective generally. It's just not effective in the courts. It's more effective in the legislature where they try to create laws. When you're trying to interpret existing law, things are different because these debates have already occurred in the legislative body. They've already debated the policy and they've already put together the statute. Now that you're in court, you're stuck, you're constrained by the arguments and the debates that occurred at another place in time, and all you can do is argue their interpretation, with rare exceptions. The power of judicial review has been given to the court as a crucial responsibility in assuring individual rights. I'm not trying to argue against the, the program generally, but I'm just trying to argue specifically as to its application in my case. It's a good argument, but it's not really supported by a statute or a rule. I'm going to get a lot better at this later on, guys. This is my first real fight against the government. And so I really don't know any of this stuff that I'm explaining to you in the video back then in 2010. Paragraph 3, I am disagreeing again. In order to protect the rights of individuals, specifically those of parents, the legislature went through obvious lengths to narrow the scope of the fictitious address program and limit the authority of the respondent. I don't think it's obvious. I actually warn people against using these phrases, obvious, clearly. I also warn people about using bold and underlying too much. Oh, I wish I could remember what video I do that in. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and move on. I do talk about that in the video and I explain why it's not a good idea. If something is obvious, you don't have to say it. They'll know it's obvious because it's obvious. It just kind of jumps out at them. When you try to tell the reader hey, this is obvious or this is clear, um, it kind of, in my opinion, a little bit backfires on you. And I think the judges expect this a lot more from self-represented parties, self-represented uh, self people without an attorney. And it's just one of those marks of a non-lawyer. You kind of want to get off you. You kind of want to get to the point where you are, on, you know, basically on the front lines of arguing your case and not so much just not having a clue as to how any of this stuff works. And one of the things that you can do is not use those words that many, that often and also not use um, that many bold and, and underlying um, like I'm doing in this paper. When respondent issues a fictitious address, it takes a fundamental right away from a parent and that this should not be taken lightly and that pursuant to this law, the legislature did not desire it to be taken lightly. And again, this is the law that requires somebody to be an actual victim. Here's where I'm citing one of those federal cases. Respondent opines that since he only has five days to review the application that the legislature did not intend there to be an opportunity to contest the, applica the applicant's bona fides, and the respondent states, nor should there be. Petitioner holds that the United States Supreme Court, and I cite these two cases, would undoubtedly disagree, having maintained a long-standing precedence that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects fundamental liberty interests of parents in the care, custody, control of their children. This is true, um, but my approach to fixing this, my approach to creating due process in this particular situation is incorrect. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court does find due process concerns here and they do fix this problem but they take a different approach it's it's an approach that i do take and use successfully later on it, it happens around 2000 i don't know 14 i think um yeah it sounds about right 2014 but um we're gonna get to that when i get to that point in this series troxel v granville this is a big deal of a case federal case and it talks about the fundamental liberty interest parents have. Again, these are kind of way up high cases. You want to focus more on cases that in your actual state, if you can find them. There's a lot of times a case that cites one of these federal laws that actually is published in your state. And if that ever occurs, use that case instead because that is actually a way for you to communicate to your judge, hey, not only do I have a federal case from the United States Supreme Court, but your Supreme Court judges in this state have used this case in this way. It's always better to try to find a local case. Uh, let's see here. Paragraph 4. I disagree. I am not attempting to convey whether or not I was a better parent. I'm just asking the government to reveal a single fact indicating that she is a victim of DV, as is required by the statute. The arguments and quarrels referenced by respondent are actually attempts to illustrate the consequences of deviating from the statutes laid out by the legislature regarding the issuance of the fictitious address. Um, saying, you know, I'm really, I'm not really taking on their argument, it looks like. The argument about 
a contested hearing. I'm not seeing that. And it's probably because I did a little bit of research and realized they just didn't have any argument against it. Paragraph 5 here. I'm citing another statute. It says nothing of judicial review. I'm citing another statute here, subsection 7 and 8. And it states that any petition for judicial review must follow a sub uh, chapter 233B. And it looks like I'm citing 533.450, but why? Explicitly authorizes judicial review of a state engineer's decision, however. Um, I'm trying to draw an analogy here, but I don't think it's effective. I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to compare and contrast other statutes. This is probably a statute the government cited. Maybe they cited the wrong statute, I don't know. And I'm just saying that it doesn't talk about judicial review at all. And then subsection 8, I may have the same argument. I'm not going to go in and double check these because I already know I'm going to lose this case for the reasons explained and I agree with that outcome. <clears throat> Scrolling down. Paragraph 6. I disagree again. The court has stated that pursuant to an order, as a general rule, parents are entitled to know where their children reside. Okay, it's nice that the judge in my case says that, but that's not authority. I can't force um, the government to do something just because the judge in my case, in which the government is not even involved, said so. It just doesn't work that way. Reply to decisions supported by substantial evidence. Uh, paragraph 2, I disagree. The respondent states that pursuant to subsection 4, okay, this is the other statute that I was talking about earlier. This is the statute 217.462 that contains a list of items that, if provided to the government, triggers a issuance of a fictitious address. And I am arguing here that a temporary restraining order is not... Uh, where am I arguing it? Whereas in Nevada, only the threat of DB occurring is required. Okay, well, there, that answers my question. I did eventually point it out. And it looks like I try, tried to draw an analogy to Montana, but I'm not sure that there was a point for me to have to do that. I mean, I could have just pointed out the statute's language in Nevada. That's all I really had to do. But for some reason, I wanted to compare it to Montana. It was very confusing to me looking at this all these years later, so I'm sure it was confusing to the judge too. Oh, and then this is an interesting comparison. This is actually pretty cool, I think. Um, the government's loose interpretation of the law brings to question the possibility that perhaps, quote, a record of conviction, unquote, would authorize the government to issue a fictitious address, even if it was a conviction for shoplifting. This is actually a really good argument. I should have put this one first. <laughs> what I'm saying here is that the government's argument is nonsensical because um, that specific listed item is just an example of what my ex can provide. It's not something that forces the issuance of the address. And what I'm trying to do to sort of um, buttress that assertion is I'm saying, hey, take a look at this item, a record of conviction. It doesn't say anything about DV there, it just says any conviction. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, well, if the government's right about the, um, the restraining order, protective order being something that triggers um, somebody actually being a victim of domestic violence, then so could a record of conviction for shoplifting. Uh, it's, it's a good argument, it's a good point, but all it really does is underline the fact that the legislature sometimes puts together these statutes in a really sloppy manner that confuses everyone, including the judges themselves. Um, I didn't think of this at the time. I do find this out over time as I start to file appeals and I start to see how the Supreme Court thinks, but at the time that I put this together, I thought that was a good argument. And even now as I look at it, it is kind of silly. Um, it is kind of true, so. Oh, so I'm starting to point out more problems, which is good, but I don't see how it's going to help me because of the problem that the government raised with regards to jurisdiction. But anyway, the statute 217.462 subsection 4 is just an example of prima facie evidence. Um, and I go on to point out the fact that there are other statutes and that they contradict what the government is doing here. For example, two, uh, 125C.230 subsection 16. This is a statute that I've talked about in my video, Domestic Violence. And this is a statute that explains that if a parent is a perpetrator of domestic violence and they are disqualified from having physical custody of a child. Well, in my child custody case, this wasn't true. And so I wasn't disqualified from getting physical custody of my son. So what I'm trying to do is point out how laughably absurd this whole situation is. Because there's another law over here that says I can't even have custody. And guess what? I have custody of my son. So 
I am apparently too dangerous to know where my child resides, but I have custody of him. So, I mean, yeah, that does kind of make the government look ridiculous, and it was a good thing to bring up, but it's not going to really get me through this case. Later on, I do bring this up in the other petition that I file, and I do think that that was a really effective argument, but we're not there yet, so I'm trying to stay focused. Uh, let's see here. Reply to remedies seeked by petitioner not available. Um, paragraph 2. Petitioner disagrees. The respondent is in violation of statutory provisions and therefore pursuant to 233b.135, the decision should be reversed. The legislator made it clear that specific evidence was required. I already kind of beaten a dead horse here, so I'm going to just move on. Uh, let's see here. Paragraph 3. I disagree again. Reversing the decision would indirectly require her to provide her true address to me because she is already required pursuant to the order, and I, I point out the order of the court, to reveal it. The court is authorized pursuant to this law, 217462-2B, which is true, to order the government to reveal the address. Yes. And this is cited by the Supreme Court later on when I win the case. Uh, paragraph 4. Elaboration on the awarded cost pertaining to this case can be found in 18.020 subsection 4. It doesn't say anything here. I don't know if this is the one that uh, talks about special proceedings. It might be. I want to take a look at this um, probably after the video. But again, laws, laws could change. I don't want to get too. Um, I don't want to get too into these actual statutes and subsections because I might mislead some of my viewers later on, especially if they watch this three or four or five years later when the laws change, which they do change somewhat frequently. We have here. 12.015 subsection 4. I've talked about this before. It's just a law that says whenever you get your fees waived and win your lawsuit, the opponent is supposed to pay those fees directly to the court since they waived your fees. Reply to conclusion. I disagree. The legislator made its intentions clear by narrowing the scope of respondent's power regarding the matter. Um, just saying the same thing here. Uh, let's see. The, if the respondent can shield itself from judicial review using a technicality, then... The respondent would be immune to the court's scrutiny or the legislature's mandates. Okay, so I'm half right. And what I'm saying here in principle is true, but they actually do have a remedy to what I am pointing out. The government isn't immune, you just have to use a different legal vehicle, and that is the petition for writ of mandamus. It's a different vehicle, and that is what I eventually figure out. I do use that, and I do succeed when I use that. The petition for judicial review is unfortunately not here to help me. Uh, paragraph 2, I disagree. The government must take issuance of the fictitious address. Um, oh, okay, okay, I'm just rehashing what I've already stated in the uh, reply. Here's my affidavit in support thereof. And this is, as I've mentioned before, mandatory. It is the um, declaration under oath. No, it's an actual affidavit. I got it notarized. It is an affidavit under oath and stamped by a notary that I and swearing everything that I've asserted in this document, every factual thing that I've asserted, is true under penalty of perjury. Next document. Notice of no intent to request hearing. Okay, so I'm just letting the court know that I do not intend to request a hearing in this matter. I, I, I really don't like going to hearings at, I was going to say at this time in 2010, but even now. My strength has always been in writing. Attorneys, they're in court all the time. They're always going to be stronger when it comes to oral arguments. Being a non-attorney... Sometimes the best thing you can do is in writing because you can hit that backspace key <laughs> and keep yourself from saying things that don't make sense, that don't apply, that are wrong. You can also put together one of these documents over the course of several days, and sometimes you'll think of things that you didn't think of at the time when you you know started drafting it. So I don't like hearings, and I'm letting the court know here that I don't want a hearing, but I want to talk about this a little bit more. This is apparently mentioned in the statutes, the Petition for Judicial Review Statutes, um, that's not what they're called, but the statutes that allow you to file this and explain when you can file it, they mention that you can ask for a hearing if you want one. And the court can give you a hearing if you have asked for one, but they don't have to. Um, what it appears to me is if you don't ask for a hearing, the court just has to render a decision on the briefs. If you do ask for a hearing, the court can, if it decides to, have you come in and talk, but they don't have to. They can still say, okay, well, it's nice that you asked, but no. The thing that I wanted to mention is... These proceedings are very much treated like appeals. They even follow the rules of appellate procedure. The briefs that are filed are the same as those that are filed in an appeal. And the uh, apparently, the judge is bound by the record in the administrative hearing. And this 
is one of the problems with my approach. There was no hearing. There was no uh, back and forth. There was no debate with my ex. And so this this petition for judicial review, it just it, it doesn't work. And uh, this is sort of supposed to be like a way for you to ask for oral arguments. It's the equivalent of asking for oral arguments in the uh, you know Supreme Court of Nevada or in the Court of Appeals. But um, I really don't understand any of that. I'm just thinking a hearing is a chance for me to just go in and talk. And I hope this explanation helps people a little bit. It's going to be tough for people to understand if they haven't really done a few appeals or at least some research on appeals. But basically, this was my opportunity to say, hey, could I get some oral arguments here? And um, I just decided to say no for unrelated reasons. But I wanted to explain to my viewers what the point of asking for uh, a hearing is. And I should clarify a little bit further because I haven't really made this clear yet. But you are constrained by the record in that administrative hearing. What happened in the lower hearing is the only sort of testimony, facts, and evidence that the district court in this case can consider. You can't think of a hearing as a chance for you to go in and just sort of testify again or try to argue your case again a second time. You can't do that. All you can do is if they say yes, which is probably unlikely if the judge says yes and you know he'll allow me to come in and ar argue orally over this petition for, for judicial review all i would be arguing is how the administrative hearing officer whoever it was that made the decision made the incorrect decision and i would be bound by the things that were stated in the administrative hearing and the documentation that was provided considered and of course points of law it wouldn't be like like a situation where i could go in and i could say hey your honor I'm going to testify some more as to why this particular fact or this particular fact or this thing happened or that wasn't true. You can't do any of that anyway. You're just stuck with whatever happened in the administrative hearing. If you know, I'm going to recommend people watch a couple of videos that I think will help too. Watch the video standard of review and watch the video filing an appeal. That'll hopefully get people sort of on board with what's going on with this petition for a judicial review. But yes, it's it's for the most part like an appeal. It doesn't have the name appeal. It's not called an appeal, but it mimics the process of an appeal and it has this label, Petition for Judicial Review, attached to it. Request for submission. This is, I have a video on this uh, request for submissions. It just tells the court that the documents submitted are ready for a decision. The court can now take a look at them and um, render a decision on them. And I'm listing the documents that have been uh, submitted and are ready. And those are the opening brief, the answering brief, the reply brief, and my notice of no intent. And again, watch the video request for submission if you'd like to learn more. Not every district in Nevada even uses this. And I'm sure there are entire states out there that don't even use this thing. Certificate of service by mailing. I am just letting the court know that certain documents were mailed to the government. One is the reply brief and the other is the request for submission. I'm also listing the notice, which is good. And I am indicating that I served Wayne Howell by placing this document into a sealed envelope and mailing it to him. This is called Rule 5 Service in Nevada. Totally valid. Next document here, we have the notice of change of address. So I've moved again. I've gotten probably four of these gone over four of these. I have a video dedicated to the importance of the notice of change of address. I'm not going to talk about it again, but I will say that it is crucial that you notify the court when your address has changed. As soon as your address has changed, do not dilly-dally on this. If a document is mailed to your old address and you don't live there anymore, but you did not file the notice of change of address, that counts as you being served with certain exceptions. For example, California, there are other states that have additional protections in place, but I'm not going to talk about that in this video because I talk about that in the video, Notice of Change of Address. Next document is the Certificate of Service by Mailing. Again, and this is probably just that notice I just went over. Yeah, the Notice of Change of Address. I'm just letting the court know that I mailed that Notice of Change of Address to uh, Wayne Howell, which is the uh, Solicitor General, and he is representing the government in this case. Going into the aftermath, I filed all six documents, but they were free filings, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. The government didn't file any of these documents, so they incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. To review my reply brief, the government probably put less than an hour into that, maybe even 
15 minutes. I doubt anything in there alarmed them, anything surprised them, anything gave them any worries. They probably skimmed through it really quickly and just put it away. Let's call it 15 minutes um, for the reply brief. To look at my notice of no intent to request a hearing, a minute maybe. I, we should just not even give time for that. Request for submission, same thing. Um, certificate of service, same thing. Notice of change of address. Uh, I guess that one might take them a little bit of time. Um, we could say five minutes for the notice of change of address and five minutes for all of the other documents. Both notices, uh, no wait, um, the first notice, the request for submission, and both certificates of service by mailing. So five minutes for all four of those documents, five minutes for the notice of change of address. We come to 10 minutes there, 15 minutes for the uh, reply brief. Let's just round it up from 25 minutes to 30 minutes, make it easy. And at a rate of $250 an hour, we have $125 in attorney fees. As with all my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post something down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.